With that, I must Order. another of initiatives. The time has expired. I call David Clendon. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, this, if one was to, to assign a theme to this budget, it would be about austerity. It would be about getting the best for every dollar spent. It would be about cutting government spending to the extent possible, which makes it all the more extraordinary that this government is proposing to spend over a billion dollars, in fact, over $1.1 billion, on what is effectively a failed model for corrections. A decade ago, the government's uh, vote on corrections was to the tune of $430 million. It has gone up some 250 per cent in one decade. And that sort of increase in what is a flawed, failed mechanism is simply unsustainable, and one wonders why we are perpetuating a completely failed mechanism. <laughs> we are looking at something like $250,000 of capital expenditure for every bed we provide in prisons. We are spending something like $93,000 per year per head of each prisoner, each inmate in our prisons. And this is a tragic waste of money. It's a tragic waste of human potential. It is a failed social experiment. And that, to his great credit, has been recognised by none other than the Minister of Finance, who is on record as calling prisons moral and fiscal failures, and how very right he is. He is rightly concerned not only at the waste of money, but certainly at the moral issue that we are locking people up. There is an absolute commitment to a, a punitive approach to prisons. We are determined, it seems, to punish people by locking them away for longer periods and more of them. That is a moral failure, as the Minister for Finance has quite rightly pointed out. Uh, the, the, shall we say, the champion of this punitive approach, Mr McVicar, of the organisation which I refuse to uh, dignify with the descriptor sensible, uh, called the Minister, referred to the Minister of having capitulated, waved a white flag. In fact, it was the first show of good common sense from the government, that reference to moral and fiscal failure that we've seen. And we do hope that that minister will assert his influence within the party to get a changed approach. There have been minor changes, there have been some shifts, but they are, are, are very minor. And I think some of the improvements around things like drug and alcohol treatment, about literacy programs, we can probably shoot home to the co-leader of the Māori Party, Peter Sharples, who understands very well that the current uh, block them up for longer and more of them is a failed mechanism. And it's to his credit he has achieved some small steps. But what's required is an absolute paradigm shift. $1.1 billion, something like $850 million of that we will be sim spending simply locking people up in concrete boxes. And that is a primitive approach to corrections. It is unacceptable and we ought to move away from it. The Wurri Prison, which will begin construction if they, if once the tenders are assigned, um, $370 million will be spent on storing up more trouble for us further down the track. Over 1,000 men will be accommodated in there. We will be putting people in largely for short sentences. They will come out no better off than they went in. There will be no contribution to public safety, no contribution to the well-being either of the inmate or of the society against whom those people have offended. Something like that, seven, three, I'm sorry, that $370 million represents something like 11 years of current expenditure on drug and alcohol rehabilitation. And that is simply ludicrous to waste that sort of capital at a time when the country, the government, is capital constrained on, what, on mechanisms which we know will simply fail. Corrections themselves, the department tells us, that something like 83 per cent of prisoners, of inmates, have some sort of drug and alcohol problems. <coughs> we know that some 80 per cent of offending is in some way linked to alcohol or drug or substance abuse, while the offender is under the influence or coming from that sort of a background. Yet only something like 5 per cent of sentenced prisoners <coughs> are obliged to do uh, drug or to go through drug and abuse programs. I do not criticise the judges in that. There are simply not the programmes made available. We know that community-based programmes of, uh, of abuse treatment, of alcohol treatment, are significantly more successful and remarkably less expensive 
than prison-based activities. And yet we continue to spend, to waste money, putting money into the correction centre simply to hold people in cells rather than seek to deal with the root problems. Mr. The Honourable Judith Collins. Oh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak in, in, in relation to vote corrections. Can I take the opportunity to thank the Law and Order Committee for the courtesy and the chair for the courtesy which was displayed to corrections in the very long time that we had with the committee, as I recall, an hour and a half. Um, it's interesting to hear the, uh, the speaker who's just resumed his seat make his comments about corrections. I did not notice one question from his party in the transcript for the Law and Order uh, hearing in relation to corrections, not one question, two corrections from that party. And one has to wonder about if they're suddenly so worried about corrections and the imprisoning of people who are, who are criminals, then perhaps they should have asked at least a question. Can I also say that I would like to thank the staff of the Department of Corrections for the fantastic work that they have done over the last three years, in particular the embracing that they have of what I have required from them, which is excellence, accountability and professionalism. They have come an awfully long way in a very short period of time. The, speak, uh, the uh, first speaker on this debate, uh, Mrs Dean, referred to the fact that, for instance, we have now got no smoking in our prisons from the 1st of July. And that actually is a testament to the work of the correction staff, a year-long programme of getting people to understand in the prisons that it was simply not acceptable for our staff to have to put up with air conditions that were 12 times worse than that in a normal home of a smoker because of the fact that this is a prison. They, are the, they were the only people in New Zealand who were required to work in a smoke-filled environment, not a smoke-free environment. And I'd like to thank the people who did give support to corrections at this time. That they did not do it all alone. They had tremendous support from the Ministry of Health and Quitline. Um, over 6,000 prisoners are now using nicotine replacement therapy, either by way of patches or lozenges. And I would like to thank the partners that Corrections has worked with in this area. But first off, I'd like to say, and most importantly, it's the staff that have made the big difference. They needed leadership. They needed to know that they we had confidence in them and they have repaid the people of New Zealand in spades. The public confidence in corrections has gone to 61%. The best it ever was under the previous government was 40%. They have done a tremendous job. We have removed, for instance, uh, things like razor blades being stored in the cells of high security prisoners. You know, listening to the comments about how prisons are so terrible and they don't make people any better. Well, what's the alternative? Leave them out there? Would people really like recidivist murderers, as we do have in our high security prisoners, prisons, left out in the community on home detention? A, a point of order, David Clendon. Mr Speaker, the previous speaker from the government, and now the Minister, um, as, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I understand we are debating vote corrections. We are talking about the appropriation for this, this current financial year. What we are hearing is a great deal of history, what has been done, yep. some self-congratulatory <coughs> statements. Well, I thank, I thank the member for his comments. Um, when we are on the estimates, um, the member is correct. However, there is also some licence to be able to expand, which has been uh, the chairpersons have over the period of the last few hours allowed that uh, to take place and I'm continuing that vein. Um, I know the Minister will come back to, she has mentioned uh, what was in the, um, the report. Uh, she mentioned that at the beginning and I'm sure she'll uh, finish your last few minutes on that as well. Well, Mr Chair, thank the you. The Honourable Judith Collins. Thank you, Mr Chair. Obviously, they don't like to be able to get some answers back having asked all the questions. Um, but, of course, the questions were asked today, not at the time when they could have got answers directly from corrections. And I would say to that member who obviously objects is that the 1st of July is actually part of this financial year and if he hasn't worked that one out then I think he should go back to school or get one of our numeracy programmes we have in corrections. One of the things that I think is really important with corrections is actually the case management model that they are introducing which is actually quite different from what was trialled in previous years which was having corrections officers being case managers. This is actually trying to address the issue that we have prisoners coming into the prisons 
They go through all these sorts of programs. Their main concern is about what programs are available to them, not necessarily a planned approach about what's the best route through for them to be able to get them into a situation where they come out better than when they came into corrections. But the new program is going to be very much based around, the model is going to be based around having trained case managers working with uh, prisoners as they come in, looking to see what are their issues. Do they have drug and alcohol addiction problems? And some will have, many will have. Can they read and write? After many years in the education system, can they read and write? If not, what can we do about it? And I think it's also important to triage in terms of are these people willing to change? Because I don't believe we should go around with rose-coloured spectacles thinking that every prisoner is simply waiting for someone to love and care them and, and, and hug, hug them. And frankly, I think that is a stupid view and that that might be true for some, but it is not true for recidivist violent offenders. However, I think that we can change people's lives if they want to change, and I'm very pleased with the Department of the Work they've been Order. doing. The uh, question is that vote corrections stand part of the schedule. Those of that opinion will say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. The ayes have it. No. Party vote's been called for. I'll ask the clerk for a party <laughs> vote. New Zealand National, 57 votes in favour. New Zealand Labour? 42 opposed. Green Party? 9 opposed. That's right. Action New Zealand? 5 votes in favour. Maori Party? 4 votes in favour. Progressive? 1 opposed. United Future? 1 vote in favour. Mana? Honourable Chris Carter? 1 opposed. Members, the ayes are 67, the noes are 53. The motion is agreed to. Can I just remind members that when they're casting votes, order, that member, when members are casting votes, they cannot be wandering around and cast the vote. They must be uh, behind their desks. So uh, I'll just bring that to the attention of members. The question now is that vote please stand part of the schedule. Mr Chair. Uh, the Honourable Judith Collins. Oh, Mr Chair, thank you for the opportunity to first off uh, thank the Law and Order Committee for its courtesy. And